Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I just want to thank you all for joining us here today, or if you're watching a recording of this, thank you for joining us and taking in our content. I'm going to be joined today by my colleague Rob Ferguson here in a little bit. Today, we're going to do a little refresher of the information that we covered in our April webinar on culture. And then I'm going to ask Rob to join us on the fun, and we will discuss some specific topics around remote working when it comes to culture and what you can do to make sure you are keeping your culture intact. We hope that you're able to leave this with some pieces of valuable information that you can use to add value in your business. So let's get started. Here at the Ferguson Alliance, we are truly passionate about people. The people in your company are one of the things that truly make your company unique. We can have a unique product or a unique service, but without a team of people moving daily in the same direction toward a common goal, your business can struggle. As a business owner or a leader, think about what gets you out of bed every morning. What is your purpose? Often, as business owners and leaders, we forget that it takes work on our part to transfer down that purpose into the organization. But this is something that, when worked, can be so magical for your business. Instilling the same passion that you have through your organization creates an energy that is so amazing that it's almost impossible to describe to you. When I managed a team, I often told them that I recognized that if they won the lottery, work is likely not going to make it to the top of the list of places that they would be going the next day, at least not at first. Careers do provide a function of providing income to create a life, not the other way around. I think leaders can be shy to take this approach because they want a team that is hardworking, head down, dedicated. But if your team is passionate about your purpose and your culture backs this up, getting your team to work and work hard comes much easier and the results are often far greater. People are not listed directly on your balance sheet under assets, but they certainly should be. We spend a lot of time being strategic about tangible assets in a business and we often tend to overlook the intangible assets like our people. As technology advances and the world moves faster, it is so critical to be thinking about how to create a culture in your organization that fosters creativity, accountability, visibility, and trust. The people that are enrolling in your purpose, vision, and mission deserve to be set up for success. This is where the challenge can come in though. How do you do that? How do you do that in a remote world? How do you do that in an environment that just two years ago predominantly worked together in the same office under the pretense that options and flexibility were not optimal and sometimes not even optional? How do you handle that in your organization? Or how do you handle it where it still may not be optimal or in the best interest of the company to remote work? That's what we're here for today. We are going to explore these very questions. We are business advisors that, again, we are passionate about people, passionate about helping businesses to continue to drive into what we call the prosperity zone. This is the place where you can feel your collective efforts creating value in your business, your team, your customers, and your suppliers. It's a win-win for all shareholders and stakeholders in your organization. Our founder, Rob Ferguson, fellow advisor, David Schlossberg, and myself are dedicated to helping people and businesses reach and maintain the prosperity zone. We recognize that businesses and their owners and leaders need guidance and resources in order to do that. And our purpose every day is to deliver value that allows businesses to thrive economically and culturally within their industries. So who do we work with? 
We work exclusively for businesses that are privately owned by a family. Family businesses are crucial to the success of our economy, and our goal is to help those businesses live as long as they would like to. Common research tells us that only 40% of family-owned businesses survive to the second generation, 12% to the third, and 3% to the fourth. We want to reverse those statistics for our clients, and that's why we do what we do every day. So welcome. Uh, let's see, where are we gonna where are we gonna go today? We are gonna go through a highlight of the common culture issues and symptoms. Um, like we did in our April um, workshop, or I'm sorry, presentation on culture. Then we will, uh, if you did not catch that or receive a copy of it, please reach out to us, put your email in the chat. We can send you a copy and you can check it out. We will then take a look at some of the things that are really needed to make a culture of excellence in a remote world. And Rob and I will address some common topics and questions that we find business owners and leaders grappling with as they work to understand what is best for their businesses and their team. And then lastly, we'll leave you with some information on how to connect with us and how you can explore more about working with us in the future. As always, we welcome your questions and comments. So if you have a question, please feel free to type those into the chat. We will be monitoring those to see if we need to address anything during the presentation, if not, we will take some time at the end to answer any questions you may have. Also, you can feel free at any time to drop in the chat in the chat any tips or tricks that you have that you want to suggest to the group as it pertains to this topic. We love collective group sharing. It's always so helpful and we want to take advantage of any sharing opportunity we have that gathers owners and leaders together. So please feel free to do that as well. So, what does culture mean, really? We hear it all the time. It's a super buzzword, culture, culture, culture. But what is it? Merriam-Webster defines it as the set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution or an organization. It's a great high-level definition of culture, but we like to take it even further. We believe that culture is your company energy, the bond. It is what is holding it all together. Again, keeping in mind the idea of driving your culture to drive you into the prosperity zone, optimizing your culture elevates your ability to retain employees, attract new ones, attract new customers, gain and maintain your brand recognition, and maintain your customer loyalty. Thriving in that prosperity zone by optimizing your culture means that you are seeing increased revenue, better strategic partnerships, and innovation within your company and your industry. So what can get in the way of that? What are some signs and symptoms that you should be addressing when it comes to your culture and issues within your organization? Let's take a look at it from the employee perspective, the customer perspective, and then from the leadership perspective. Remember, money might get people through the door, but your culture is going to keep them. You hear it all the time, people don't quit a company, they quit a manager. But maybe put in a different way, a lot of employees quit a culture. Employees want to be valued and heard. If they begin to feel that they are not valued and heard, they are gonna become more disengaged in their work, in your workplace, and in your culture. Symptoms to be on the watch out for this are, are your employees feeling like their supervisor or executive leadership team does not understand them. This could be a generational gap, a gender gap, or working styles, for example. Whatever the reason is, employees feel a disconnect between themselves and their manager or their team. Employees may feel that their work-life balance is not being valued by its company or its leaders. You may find that your employee mindset has shifted to what we refer to as an identity-based thinking instead of a commitment-based thinking. 
This looks like attitudes that may say partnership within my organization is more optimal than a must. Or they may start keeping score with other colleagues and you might hear things like, I'm being asked to do more than others. They're gonna be looking at it from a very individualized perspective. Employees may not feel like it's worth speaking up because the company leaders don't care or that the leaders do know, but after they've spoken up about something, nothing's done about it. Other things may be that employees are not clear on the time and place to, pre to present any barriers for their escalation. There's no organization around constructive feedback. And then lastly, you may feel your employees have just a tension among them and all their activities from the detailed ones to the ones that should be very simple. Now let's take a look at your customer orientation around your culture. This does not first usually come to mind when we're discussing culture, but it is imperative to analyze how your internal culture issues can impact your customer experience. And so some signs that that may be happening is that your customers are having a lack of clear and clean and concise procedures when they're experiencing your services or your product. These processes and procedures that you develop are usually developed to deliver a customer experience, whether it's how they start their customer or client engagement with you to how they receive their goods and services. Or your customer may experience inconsistencies on their customer service experience. They may get stellar service in one interaction and not so great the next time. So it leaves your customer wondering, I'm not sure what happened here. The customer might get great service from the sales team and then poor delivery on the execution end or vice versa. Or you may start to see poor reviews online or in your customer feedback surveys. And often one of the most tragic that we hear about is that your customer either overhears an employee complaining about the company or the employee complains directly to the customer about the company or the procedures. And then lastly, let's look at this from a leadership perspective. I will tell you when we're going through these, it can be very, a very tough to swallow as an owner or a leader in an organization. We do believe that a majority of leaders and executives, in fact, care a great deal about the experience of their team and their customers, yet they tend to at times be further removed from this reality as they manage the varying aspects of the business. So from a leadership perspective, you may start to experience or see that your team is constantly bickering with each other or having disagreements or tension between departments. You may find that it's harder to rally the troops around that shared vision, shared vision and goal. Or you may see some inconsistencies between your managers. Maybe some are holding their teams more accountable than others. Maybe there are some managers that are able to retain members of their team better than others. One other thing you may see is that there may be some high turnover in your organization as a whole. You may experience that your innovation is slowing. Maybe you were once seen as the leader in a certain area and that's no longer the case. Then lastly, take a look at your revenue. Is it declining or is it stagnant? This is your reminder that culture needs to move up on the priority list. You can save yourself a lot of heartache by taking the time to assess yourself and your business on your key points. And remember that can be turned around. So those were our symptoms that you may be experiencing a culture issue. So now that you've assessed your business from that perspective, now what? So here at the Ferguson Alliance, we believe that there are five elements of a culture of excellence. And it starts with your customer orientation. So we looked a little bit about um, at the symptoms. So now think about these things. Does your team understand the value of the customer? Do they really know and respect the value that the customer brings to your business? Do you also think about and place emphasis on the long-term value of a customer to the business? Building strategic partnerships with your customers can really make a huge impact on your business long-term. And do you have a clear picture of how your customers rate their experience with you? 
Are you performing routine customer feedback surveys or providing them ample opportunities to give you their feedback? Secondly, the employee orientation. This is also think about your employees as your internal customer. How well is the organization working to make sure that team members feel purposeful, heard and understood? Just like they're just like your customers, are you doing routine employee surveys? Do you have opportunities for employees to get feedback on their performance? How well are they oriented around the vision, mission and values of the organization? Is this the top of mind within your organization? Or are you just discuss it once a year or once every couple of years or maybe never? Your vision, mission and values is your culture on paper. These are the elements of your being. If someone were to summarize your company behavior and elements, it should look a lot like your mission, vision and values. Is this true for your company? Now, do you have the right people in place to maximize team effectiveness? Thankfully, people are very different. Do you know what makes your team members unique? Do you know what situations they thrive in? And do you work to make sure they are placed in those roles? Now that we've looked at customer and employees, let's talk about performance standards. Does your organization provide clear expectations and hold true to their expectations? Do people know exactly what would happen if the ball was dropped? Are these consequences applied fairly and routinely? Or is the goal more once, once moved around, once it's achieved and never celebrated, creating some discouragement within the team? Also think about this. Does your team trust that you are going to do what you say, that you are going to walk the walk and not just talk the talk? It's very, very important to get clear on this. Then the last two things that we look at and consider in our culture of excellence is this is a big one and we hear it all the time that change that sorry that the only thing that never changes is that everything changes. How well are you subscribing to this? Are you acknowledging that it's much easier to have a continual improvement and change process on in your organization? rather than large and involved change initiatives. Working your organization through the change process often through smaller changes can make a huge difference when you need to make a larger change initiative. It can be just like anything else that seems very scary at first, but the more you do it, the better you get at it. Not to say that it still will not be difficult, but your organization will get more comfortable with it to eliminate some of the fear behind it. And now lastly, our last element is how strong is your process orientation? Processes set clear examples for the, sorry, clear expectations for the team. How well is your organization relying on these processes to accomplish goals? There's a fine line between flexibility and structure that must be acknowledged. Processes are something that you really want to pair with your change muscle. You should always be open to evaluation as to not close off a customer or employee or even a supplier in your quest to be process oriented. Are yours clear and stored for people in the organization can access them? And do they know who to ask about them? Does the team know the proper places and spaces to propose change to your processes? And do they feel comfortable doing so? So those are our five elements of culture. And now we are going to talk a little bit about, we've got those five elements of culture. And now what about working remotely? Certainly before 2020, there were organizations that have remote teams but 2020 saw an explosion of remote work. Companies pivoted hard and fast to make it work. And while our five elements most certainly still apply, there are other things that need to be emphasized and considered. So I'm gonna ask Rob to hop on to and show his face now um, and join in on the discussion here. And let's take a look at some additional must-haves for remote work culture and how this has impacted our clients from a cultural, generational, and business standpoint. So 
Uh, let's see, Rob, you have been advising business owners and business leaders for going on 12, almost 13 years now. Um, yeah. What would you say is the one key thing that business owners and leaders need to make sure they are doing to drive culture in a remote world? Well, I'm going to say this one thing is for in-person or remote. It doesn't matter. And that is be a visionary. Because you, you talked about in your opening comments about gaining alignment, and that's where culture is. To, as you discuss, culture to us is that alignment. And it's aligning to what? Well, it's the future. What, what is the vision that that um, leader has? Because culture can't, I think it's impossible to drive culture with just one person. Uh, you know, a business owner, a business leader can't drive culture. It takes a group effort. It's it it's something that you have to you have to solicit and enroll others into it. And so, you know, culture really does reside in those shared beliefs, that shared vision that you talked about early. So that's what I would say is, and it's particularly more challenging remote because you you're not always seeing people every day. And so I, I do think that uh, that leader, when he's uh, doing a video call or sending out an email, you know, being very clear on what the future looks like and, you know, where the company's going or what the, um, the, the core beliefs are of the business. It, can't, it, it, it cannot be repeated enough. You talked about walking the talk and uh, you got to do the same thing remotely, right? You have to. If you expect your people to be on Zoom calls, you need to be on Zoom calls. If you expect them to be attentive and engaged, you need to be attentive and engaged. So um, I think really and truly being a visionary is, is critical. Absolutely. And I think that and that brings in this intentionality aspect to it of that you even in a remote world have to be even more intentional about doing that because when you're not interacting face to face every day, it takes an added layer of intentionality to make sure that that's coming through in your remote interactions. Yeah, yeah no, that's that's a really good point. So, so many business owners that are maybe founding business owners, they're subject matter experts and they, they went from zero to 30 million or whatever the number is. And that's their success model. But when you're trying to go from 30 million to 100 million, a new success model has to be created. And you probably have more employees than when you first started. So being intentional, as you're saying, to the future, uh, honor the past, right? But you got to build on the past. And you have to be able to articulate in simple terms, what does that future look like from a people or an employee perspective, a customer perspective, process perspective? You have to be very, very clear on that and be focused on it all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think historically trust in an organization has been built through a combination of your results on your promises made and through smaller daily routine interaction with each other in the office setting. Um, given the nature of remote work, how can businesses foster trust? And are there certain things that employees need to make sure they are doing to establish trust within the organization? Yeah, I think it's that's a great question. Um, first, leaders need to let go. Uh, they, they need to let go. They need to be able to delegate. Now, certainly, you have to have competent people to delegate to, and that's another topic about how do you, how do, you do that. But when leaders don't let go, that, that connotes a lack of trust to the organization. They can't, they can't delegate, say, a routine task or, you know, uh, an, an operational issue. So leaders first need to, to let go by delegating. And then secondly, um, all the other stakeholders in the company, the employees, they need to be accountable. So it's one thing to say, yeah, I want... I, I want to. I don't want to be micromanaged. I want to be able to do this. Well, that's fine. So the leader's going to let go and delegate, but then that employee's got to be accountable. 
and, and has to own the results of getting it done or not getting it done and own the consequences of getting it done or not getting it done. So I think when, as leaders let go, they delegate to their employees and as employees own that, uh, that, that uh, opportunity, they own the results, then accountability increases and the higher the level of accountability you have in an organization, the higher the trust you're gonna have in the organization because trust and accountability go hand in glove. Working remotely, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my daughter, she's moving into a remote position. And um, you know, she's very attentive to getting her work done. And, and uh, she was here for a couple of days of vacation, uh, but she had promised to get a project out. So she found a place to work quietly to get her work done and, and she got it done. So the, the point being r- remote work, um, you know, it's, it's the front of the hand and the back of hand. The, the front of the hand says, oh, it's great. I have better balance of life. I can get more things done. The back of the hand is, is well, it's at home. It's disrupting my personal life. And I don't have a work environment. And I'm not nearly as productive. So it is a real balance. I think we're all learning um, how, how, to, how to do that. But the best way to increase trust in working remotely is leaders trusting and delegating to their employees when they're remote as well as those employees being fully accountable uh, to the results while they're working in a remote condition. Yeah, that's a great point. And this really goes well with the intentionality as well. Um, When you're remote to build that trust, when you're being intentional about being present for meetings, being engaged in the meeting, um, that can really build that trust from a remote perspective as well with your colleagues, especially. Yeah, I agree. So everything is certainly more memorable when you're a part of an experience rather than just watching it. How important would you say this is for business leaders to put some thought into making virtual meetings more interactive? Well, it's, it's uh, I don't know, what's what's more important than very important. It's extremely very important. I mean, it's it's at the top of the list because this is new. Um, we You said it in your opening comments. It was just two years ago. Uh, for most businesses, it wasn't an option to work remote. And it was looked down upon. Uh, in fact, if you worked remote, you had to pretend that you weren't remote. <laughs> and now... <laughs> Now we're all working remote and this, everyone is a lot more comfortable with it. So yeah, yeah it has to be very, very thoughtful. Um, and, and you've been using the word intentional as well to, to make sure you can, you'll never replicate an in-person meeting experience, never. I, during COVID, I, I tried to attend some networking socials uh, virtually and I did not like it at all. It, it was very awkward and And I didn't do it. I mean, you just can't replicate that feeling or that experience remote. So I don't think it's better. Um, I don't think it's worse. I think it's just additive. And so you got to be thoughtful about how to how to do virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the more the more you can get people to report on just general things personally, giving everyone an opportunity to check in. what have they been up to, anything that they want to share, Um, and then making sure that everyone has a role in that virtual meeting to keep them engaged to where, and and honestly, it's a best practice too for when you're in person as well, making sure that, you know, as many people as possible in the meeting have something to present on or something to speak on so that, that they are engaged and enrolled in that process as well can be very helpful. Yeah, I agree, Brandy. And of course, you know, we're really big on the Socratic approach and Socratic listening. And so that means we ask a lot of questions in our organization as well as with our clients. And so on these virtual meetings, I think it should be more towards asking questions as opposed to just reporting. Um, I think another good best practice for virtual meetings is polls. That's a really nice feature. Uh, when we're, we, we've done polls on these webinars and that helps us get the audience engaged. We don't, we don't have one today, 
but I, those polls uh, for webinars or internal meetings seem to be very effective. It keeps people engaged. The other thing that we're using quite a, quite a bit now, as you know, Brandy, is uh, virtual whiteboards. Um, th those tend to really be helpful where you can put virtual sticky notes up on the whiteboards uh, during the meeting or quite honestly, after the meeting, uh, you can continue. Uh, you know, here at Alliance, we use um, uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams is our collaboration tool but that really helps us, I think, can continue the action after the meeting, to continue the, the, the purposefulness of the virtual meeting. So it just doesn't go away. Um, so anyway, I, I do think that's important, um, you know, using some of those tools. And uh, I think that keeps people engaged. Yeah. And we should note too, for everyone watching, that we are a remote company as well. Um, we we office remotely. We have a collaboration center that we we work at if needed. Um, but but we are living and breathing these practices as well. So I thought that would be important to note. You know, one of the other things too before you go to your next question, and we've talked about it internally, is setting uh, setting some behavior norms for virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've kind of kidded about it in, internally, but probably the worst thing anybody can do during a virtual meeting is eat food <laughs> because the, it, it's so magnified, right? Your face is in the screen and maybe you're having a bite of spaghetti and it, it is not a pleasant scene. So setting some protocols, some meeting behavior, some meeting norms for video meeting, I, I think is really, really important as well because again, that's going to keep people interactive and participating and they they know what's expected of them and they know what they can expect. Absolutely. Note to self. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the common things that I keep seeing when we discuss remote work is that it really does take quite a bit of work to work remotely. Um, from being intentional to being more thoughtful on meeting content, it is truly a different mode of operation from being in person. Um, in order to prevent that out of sight, out of mind disconnect, can you speak a little bit about on the importance of individual check-in meetings for leaders with their team members and the issues that might come up if you're not intentional with having those meetings? Yeah. Um... It's it's a hard thing to do. I think the ad hoc phone calls are very important. And it's just a if, if you can just call, whether it's on the cell phone or the direct phone um, at Alliance, we use the Teams phone function. So we we chat and and, and call each other regularly uh, on Teams. But that check in, not necessarily to do business, but just, hey, how are you doing? Um, do you have everything you need? Um, how was the vacation? You know, just trying to cause that dialogue that you would normally have maybe in the break room. Um, it's it's not going to be the same, don't, and I don't think you should pretend that it's the same, but it's a step, right? It's a step forward to stay connected. And I think supervisors should be having ad hoc phone calls regularly uh, with their remote employees. And if you don't, then your employees are going to feel left out. Um, Brandy, you and I were conducting a workshop at a company uh, last week, and that came up. Uh, it came up multiple times. So there's an outside sales force. It's a large company. And, you know, the office, the headquarters has, I don't know, some sort of special social event and uh, celebration, but the outside sales team doesn't get invited or doesn't participate. So when that came up in a survey, you were talking about doing surveys in your opening comments, the company leadership recognized, oh, well, we forgot, you know, 30 employees. We've got to do something. So they did. So they sent, uh, I, can't, I can't remember what they said they did. They sent them some coffee, a card for coffee or cookies or so. They did something to say, oh, we're, we're celebrating so-and-so's birthday and we want you to be part of it. And just taking that step made a huge difference the, for that 
that empl those employees working remote to feel part of the bigger community. Um, the consequences, if you don't, you're gonna you're gonna probably lose the attention and the connection of employees. And we know how hard it is today to keep employees or to even hire employees. And so retention needs to be really, really important. Um, again, I'm going back to an experience. I, I watched my daughter over Monday. Um, she was working remote on Monday. And uh, I asked her at the end of the day, I said, hey, how'd your day go working remote? She said, it was awfully quiet. I got no emails. I said, you got no emails? Oh, she said, well, actually, I got one email. I said, yeah. And she said, yeah. Come to think of it, it's just an email from the only other remote employee. Now, this company she works for, I think, has about three or 400 employees. So there's, they have two full-time remote people, my daughter and this other girl. And what she realized, she said, I didn't know this was a holiday. It was, you know, Juneteenth. That was a, a her company was recognizing that as a holiday. Well, she didn't get the memo, so to speak. So then you got somebody who's feeling left out. Um, so all I would just say is the consequence of not staying engaged and constantly thinking to be inclusive, uh, making those ad hoc phone calls, uh, you do run the risk of um, um, losing some really good employees. Uh, because they don't feel connected, which is really important today's, to today's uh, millennial work generations. They want to feel connected and purposeful. Absolutely. That's what I was just about to add was that it really makes a huge difference um, and does not take a huge amount of time investment to do this. And even right. if you have to make a list of all your people and, and keep track and make sure, it really is very impactful with your team. Rob talked about this a little bit um, when we were talking about interactive virtual meetings, but there is so much information at our fingertips right now that it can be slightly overwhelming at times. And so when it comes to working remotely, it can be especially overwhelming to decide where is your information going to be stored? How will it be accessed? where people will communicate and how, and the list can go on and on with challenges that your business may face in organizing your remote workforce. Um, a majority of our clients are now using programs like Microsoft Teams, Monday.com, or Trello to collaborate, and they can provide great visuals for progress and also a way for people to get their communication out there without email, and without the dreaded reply all. Um, so Rob, can you describe a little bit just the value that you've seen um, in the evolution of programs like these when using them in a team environment, um, and especially a remote team environment? Yeah, it actually happened for us um, when we were doing workshops up in Omaha, uh, Nebraska in person. And I think we had 25 executives attending and these were you know two to three day workshops uh, a month and then in uh, March of uh, I guess it was 2020 that was the last workshop we did because everything shut down and so we had a the the uh, CEO of the company wanted to continue the workshops but needed to he just said but well, we got to figure out a way to do it virtually so we really scrambled trying to find the right platform we we used uh, GoTo training um, for that, and it and it worked well because it you know it had the breakout room feature and it allowed us to have collaboration documents, um, you know. So we we pivoted to that, and when we first started, it was very distracting because it was novel and it was new, and people were having a hard time signing on, and you know somebody didn't have a connection or whatever it was. We've over time, we got better and more proficient at using it and, and doing video calls become, became less of a novelty and more of standard. And uh, so we've eventually, as you know, Brandy, we've, we've settled on one platform, which is Microsoft Teams. There's a, we tried a lot. We, we definitely did. What I'm seeing with our clients is those clients that are still struggling to figure out what platform are they going to use, and they're and they're doing you know some Zoom calls, some Teams calls, um, you know they're using different platforms like Trello, and that's not they don't have it integrated. It becomes overwhelming for the employees, and it 
it actually is distracting um, and it doesn't simplify. So I would just say, you know, eventually settle in on a platform that that gives you what you need. You know, there's so many bells, bells and whistles out there. You can overwhelm yourself. Try to keep it very simple. Some organizations do require a couple of programs, but then integrate it with Zapier or something of that sort seems to really help. But, um, you know, and I'm not a salesperson for Microsoft Teams, but we have, we've, we've figured it out, right? I mean, that's why we, we do remote workshops on Teams. We're doing this webinar on Teams. We figured out how to use Teams and that's how we keep our central files and everything else. So anyway, yeah. uh, there's a lot out there. I would pick one. And back to what you said earlier about kind of establishing some communication protocols. Um, we have had conversations as a team to say like, hey, you know, this is how we're going to use the chat and yeah. drop in, you know, your information there. And again, back to the, it saves our em email inbox. Um, and we have a clear, we know how to communicate with each other and kind of leads us into our next uh, thing that you want to make sure that you're doing as a team and communicating your expectations. And aligning expectations is often one of the most critical things needed within an organization in order to achieve whatever goal you're trying to accomplish. And this is not just in the remote world. This is in any organization, be it in-person, remote, hybrid, whatever. Um, so you want to make sure that you are aligning those expectations. Um, so what types of expectations would you advise a client to make sure to set and communicate within the remote work environment? Well, they, they, they need to align to your overall company culture, number one. And number, number two, they should be very similar to your in-office expectations. And what, what I mean is things such as work hours. Mm -hmm. That needs to be really clearly stated. What are the work hours for people uh, working remote? In other words, can the supervisor call them up at 7.30 at night when, as, when they were working in the office, their day ended at five? So work hours need to be established. Dress codes. I, you, in, in office has dress codes. Most of our clients today, and I think most companies across America today have business, kind of business casual dress codes. That's, we're, we're not a formal business society anymore. But that doesn't mean you show up to a virtual meeting in your pajamas on top of your unmade bed. I mean, I mean you still should have a professional decorum about yourself. So I think uh, dress codes, video etiquette, we talked about that, such as, you know, eating uh, on screen or, you um, having your video on or off, depending upon what, what is required. Um, so I think going through the video etiquette, and how do you, how do you handle uh, multiple people talking at once? And so you have to work through that a little bit. Um, and then I think the workspace is really important. I, I, I believe if, if, any, if you're gonna be working remotely, you have to have a professional uh, work experience. There's nothing that makes for me personally, more uncomfortable than when I jump on a video uh, chat with somebody and I'm in their bedroom. Yeah. That just, it just doesn't seem right. I mean, at least put up a filter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, those, you know, work hours, dress code, video etiquette, um, professional workspace, those are some of the, the expectations that I would be communicating out. Um, Elon Musk came out last was it last week or two weeks ago? Yeah, he's taken a lot of criticism about his viewpoint on remote work. And what he said is that, you know, everybody's got to work at the office, in the brick and mortar office, 40 hours. And he further went on to articulate that if you don't show up to the office, we are assuming you have resigned. So what I like about that is he was being extremely clear on his expectations. In other words, employees need to be able to make choice. I mean, they get that opportunity. So what I thought Elon was doing was clearly articulating, these are the expectations of working here at our firm. And now 
you can choose to work here on our firm or you can choose not to. So that was very clear. And then he also was clear about if you don't choose, in other words, if you're going to go against the grain, then we're going to choose for you. We're not going to have you here. So I, I just think the expectations need to be communicated very, very clearly. Absolutely. And, you know, we had a, we had a former client and this goes back to trust and intentionality. Um, they had an employee where they were struggling with because she would, you know, hop on meetings and it would be like, what's that noise? She's like, oh, sorry, I'm checking out at Target. Um, it was just, it was always something when she was on the meetings and she was not being intentional um, and she was not aligning with the expectations of her remote workforce. And so that really eroded the trust with her other colleagues because it was like, well, how important is this to you if you're constantly doing something else or somewhere else when we need you? So yeah. very, very important there. Uh, and then lastly, we saved our favorite for last. Um, as much as the world has adapted to the remote culture, it is still hard to argue that there is not an immense amount of value to be had in gathering everyone in person from time to time. So being in person allows for a deeper understanding of each other and creates a stronger culture. Uh, Rob, can you tell us a little bit about how you have seen companies handle this and what benefits do you want to emphasize when it comes to meeting in person? Yeah, well, I think as I think about it <clears throat> and as I see meetings that are now going back more to face-to-face -face, and we're back in clients' offices and doing face-to-face -face meetings, coaching sessions and workshops, um, it's so everybody wants to socialize. So I would, I highly recommend Build that into your meeting time, some sort of socialization time. So if the meeting starts at eight o'clock, then why not have coffee and breakfast tacos at 7.45, you know, or 7.30 or what, whatever it is, but build that socialization time. I think that's really important. Um, the other thing that, that I would say is we're coming back together and you're you're now trying to figure out how to integrate a remote workforce and a in office workforce. You got to come together in person on some schedule, some regularity, whether that's quarterly or twice a year, maybe it's once a year. But when you do, I think allow people to get to know one another more than just their role at work, because that's what happens. We develop friendships at work. Sometimes those are maybe our, our best friends are, came from work. Now I know not everybody does develop friendships, but there is still a, an emotional connection. So as Brandy, as you know, you kind of help us with this at Alliance with our clients is, you know, we do icebreakers at meetings, you know, just, just so we, I mean, it's, number one, it's fun. Number two, it helps kind of get everybody prepared for the meeting. But number three, the icebreakers that we do helps us get to know everybody a little bit better, you know, on a little different playing field. And they're easy icebreakers, right? Like, you know, introduce yourself and tell everybody your most famous bicycle accident. Well, you know, that's fun. And But you now all of a sudden you get to know, you know, who was doing what and We've we've done that icebreaker so many times, and and uh, believe me, there are a lot of broken mm -hmm. bones in this world from bicycle accidents. So I would say, you know, socialization, having some fun, and uh, getting to know everyone is is important. We with with regular face to face meetings. I think that's really really important. Absolutely, and if you want to reach out to us for some of our favorite icebreaker questions, that is. <laughs> One of my favorite things to think about. So I can send over a lot of good suggestions for those as well. Well, all right. Thank you, Rob, for sharing all that insight on navigating the remote work culture with us. Um, we have a great advantage of seeing how many businesses tackle the same challenge. And it always reminds me 
of why we do what we do and why it's so valuable. And that is sharing our experiences with others to continue to create legacies for business. So as we wrap up, I want to stress that there are no doubt endless pieces of information out there on creating and preserving a remote work culture. Um, we certainly try to stay up to date on everything. And again, these are what we feel are the must, must haves for it. Um, intentionality, trust, interactive virtual meetings, individual team member check-ins, programs for virtual collaboration, communication of your expectations, and face-to-face -face time. It's hard to say that it would be possible to go overboard on trying to create and maintain a culture in a remote world, um, but please certainly try and let us know how it goes. Um, so at this time, we will check the chat and see if we have any questions. Um, but please feel free to um, reach out to us at any time. Anything that you want to share, again, we always, we love to hear your tips, your tricks, your stories. You tried this, it didn't work, whatever it may be um, when it comes to culture, or really when it comes to anything within your business. Again, um, sharing and collaborating is, is very valuable to us. And so we love that. We can't stress it enough. We really appreciate it. So I think at this time, I don't see anything in the chat. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, we really do appreciate you spending your afternoon with us. Um, it's very nice to have you here, or if you're watching the recording later, we appreciate that as well. Um, remember that we do have webinars twice a month, so stay connected with us on LinkedIn. Sign up on our email list on our website so that you can be in the know of what we have going on and we will make sure that we will connect with you. So thank you so much everyone for joining us.